if you're if you're a Levite, are any of you Levites? Marty, okay. If you're a Levite, you're you're gonna love this. But um, if you're a Kohen, I apologize in advance. You're not gonna be happy. Okay. I mean, if you think about it, everything is about the Kohen. They get the first Aliyah, they get to officiate at Pijinei HaBen, uh, they even get to bless us, depending upon your shul, every Shabbos or on certain holi on the holidays. Um, but do they ever transmit any Jewish values? I mean, can you find a reason outside of temple functions for the Kohanim to have survived? I, I, I can't. Did they help us become better people? Um, so, so why did why did they get all the covet? Okay, um, for more than two thousand years, Judaism has accorded higher status to the Kohen as a result of the politics of Jewish history. Because, why? Because the Bible is Jerusalem temple centric. Everybody with me? Everything functions in the Bible towards Jerusalem. Now, just think about it. Where do our most basic Jewish values come from? A study. Uh, tzedakah, intellectual curiosity, relationships with people, uh, not directly from the Kohanim. So in, in order to understand this, how we, this came to be, we need to look beyond the Chumash to the period of the judges, Samuel, and kings. Now the, the Chumash, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, is not really clear about the role of the priesthood. Um, that sometimes they're called the Kohen, Kohanim, in Deuteronomy they're called the Kohanim and the Livyim. Uh, they're called the religious, and it's they, bunched together. The, the definitions and the roles are, are, are really not well, de, well defined. Uh, but during the times of the judges, the priests, well, let's, let's look at this for a second. During the times of the judges, the priests, whoever they might be, um, since they couldn't own land, were, were wanderers. Uh, they, they wandered around without any real permanent possessions. They allegedly ministered to the needs of the people. Some probably managed local shrines like Eli did. And you remember Eli, we read the Saktor on Rosh Hashanah, he kind of supervised the birth of Samuel. Um, we know that places like Shiloh, Mitzvah, and Shechem were local shrines, and most likely there were others. As a matter of fact, the Ark of the Covenant, this is all pre-temple times, used to travel between these two shrines on a regular calendar basis so that people could, so that the locals could, could worship in, in front of the, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's probable that other religious objects that are mentioned in the Chumash, like the Urim and Tumim, uh, there are others, were probably held by other tribes and used as an object of veneration in, in other, other shrines. Now, it seems to me that different groups existed who were descendants of, of, of Levi, that is to say, members of the Levite tribe. I mean, it seems highly unlikely that a specific group of priests administered to the temple before it was created, right? A specific family could have serviced the tabernacle, but when David brought it to Jerusalem, and we read about that just week, last week, a couple of weeks ago, in a half Torah, he appointed a priest named Zadok, that's with a Z, Zadok, and Zadok's descendants serviced, well, first the tabernacle and later the temple, because Solomon built the temple, for hundreds of years until a rival priestly family called the Hasmoneans took over. And so this, apparently there were a number of priestly families and they, all of them were kind of vying for, for, for control. And the book of Chronicles, the last two books in the, in the Tanakh, details some of these genealogies, mostly of the Kohanim, of that group of priests. Now we're gonna step back, a, oh, now we're gonna step back a little bit and we're gonna to the time of Solomon. Solomon, of course, is responsible for building the temple. This was approximately the year 928, give or take, BCE. Um, he, he, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, allegedly wanted, was, was supposed to be king. 
Um, he left a lot to be desired and he was not able to gain a lot of support. And uh, the Northern tribes refused to coronate him, to inaugurate him, unless if he um, moved out of Jerusalem and went to um, forgotten the city, another, another city, an older religious city in the North to be uh, coronated. Uh, what happened was the commitment, because of Rehoboam's failure to lead and to get along with everybody, the country split into two. The Northern Kingdom was ruled by uh, Jeroboam, not Rehoboam. And I don't know why the Jeroboam is, is a symbol today for huge bottles of wine, but Jeroboam. And one of the first things that Jeroboam did was he built two sanctuaries, two temples, one in the north up by near the Sea of Galilee and one in the south um, near Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And then he appointed, he chose priests. And this priesthood, we don't, we, they, we don't know who they really were. We, have, we really don't have names. Existed as, as long as the Northern Kingdom existed, which was approximately 200 years. But what happened was a number of these priests, most likely, as well as a number of people from the North, began to migrate to the South as a response to the Assyrian invasion, which took place in 721 BCE. Now, it, it wasn't like there was this huge battle and all of a sudden the Northern Kingdom was conquered. What the, the Assyrian, it must have taken decades. And what the Assyrians would do is they would come in and they would, they would conquer a town or a village, and then they would take half of the members of that village and send them back to Assyria to integrate with, the, uh, with their people. And the other half, the, so many of the soldiers and other people, would stay and marry, in, marry into the village they just conquered in order to establish a, um, a, a loyal and peaceful group. And this, this place, that we had, in, in town after town, village after village, this was, this was occurring. And in response to this, because it seemed that it was inevitable, because they were a big army and they were very advanced, uh, the Israelites, Jews from the north, migrated south into Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem already had a priesthood, the Zadokites, and they were very happy there. So can you can imagine all these people come in, many of them were skilled artisans and craftsmen and perhaps scholars, people were, were literate at that point. Yeah, people had, right, writing had been invented around the, end, around the time of David. Uh, they come in and the king of, of, of Judah, wants to welcome them. And he's, all of a sudden he's, he encounters this, this priestly group, priests who have been administering probably in a very similar manner to the way his priests have been administering in Jerusalem to their people for almost 200 years. And he couldn't place them in the temple because that was controlled by the Zadokites. So this might be one of the reasons for the create or explanations for the creation of what we call Levites. Uh, however, there are other reasons um, as well. Uh, in order to do this, let me just share with you a, a text. If you have a, a Hebrew English Bible at home and you look up the book of Judges, chapter 17 and 18, I'm going to wait. Marty's going to go write this down. Okay. A, a lot of this, by the way, is on the uh, sheets which you can download afterwards or, or have downloaded already. But it's a very interesting story. I'm going to quote a little bit right now. And there is a man of Ephraim named Micaiah. And he built a shrine and he made an aphod and teraphim, and he consecrated one of his sons and made him a priest. And there was a young man out of Judah in the south who was a Levite, and he traveled to the lands of Micah, and Micah asked, Micah asked him, where are you from? And he answered, Bethlehem. Now, 
if you have the text in front of you um, and you can see the Hebrew, try to try to uh, then look at chapter line 30 in chapter 18. If you don't, it doesn't matter. And Yonatan, because it re reads, and Yonatan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. And that's his name. What's your name? I'm, I'm Yonatan, son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. But in the Hebrew, the word Manasseh is written in a very unique manner. Because the Nun is not on the same line as the, as the rest of the word. It's made much very tiny and it's elevated in all the text to maybe a quarter of the size of a normal letter. If you crossed out that letter, the Nun, you get the word Moshe. Okay, now, which, which, which means that Jonathan was the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. Jonathan was not a descendant of Moses' brother Aaron, he was, but, but he was Moses' grandson, and he was a priest, a Levite. Um, in, in 60, in, okay, so this is, so why is this text here? Clearly the, well, I, one would think, at least I think, that the authors of this text, or let's call them the chroniclers of this text, the people who put this story together into the shape of the book of, the book of Judges, were Kohanim. And they really, <laughs> and they didn't want to acknowledge the fact that there were other priests, Levites, who were doing this kind of work. And so they elevate, they, but they couldn't cross out, that they had this tradition, they couldn't cross out the name. So they, they make this, the, the nun so tiny that it would be looked over and one would read Menasha. Very interesting political, political statement. All right, moving forward. Oh, a couple hundred years to the year 621 BCE, um, to the time of Michael Fralick's favorite character, King, J King Jos 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 Josiah. Now, Josiah is known for doing three major things. The first thing he did was he abolished all of the local altars around the country and said you can only offer sacrifice and worship in, in Jerusalem at the temple. Now, you have to imagine something. For, for 200 years, maybe longer, in all of the villages and hamlets and, sm and small cities and in, in the country, people probably most likely guided by the elders of the community or, or local priests that they had ordained were offering sacrifices. They needed to do this. They were farm. They needed to do this. And all of a sudden it's like ripped away from them. You can imagine how they must have felt. Their, their religious, family religious and cultural and tribal practices were forbidden. And most of them couldn't afford to go to Jerusalem three times a year to offer sacrifice. So what, who do they, what do they do? How do they, who do they offer to, or how do they offer to, to make sure that so the rains come? And th at the right time, not at the wrong time. And this is probably when and why the second paragraph of the Shema entered into our Siddur and into our text. Because if you read it carefully, it goes from the singular to the plural, and it talks about what if, if it, kind of the message is, as I understand it, that um, if you can't offer, if you can't come to Jerusalem, you can offer sacrifices where you are, as long as it's done in God's name. And, and no, for, in other words, it was a compromise in order to offer comfort during Josiah's time, or post Josiah's time, actually. The second thing Josiah did was he took two separate festivals one which is spring festival, and the other was a festival commemorating our freedom from Egypt. And he combined them into the festival we now call Passover. And if you just, that's why all this stuff is on the Seder plate, and we have all of these different kinds, kind, kinds of things. Uh, and the third thing he did was he had created a civil service. He removed the system, the, the system of tribes and towns being governed by the elders, and he replaced them with his priests, his priests, uh, his workers. And he sent them out 
these priests, let's call them Levites, and he sent them out to the villages and everything else, and their job was to serve as an interpreter of the law, his law, the way he understood the law, okay? And so what the priests did is they, they ministered to the people and they taught the law. And since the law was holy, since it was God's law, the, these, these Levites, these priests, job was probably to mediate between heaven and earth. At least possibly that's the way they thought about it. Now let's, I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff in a very short period of time, but let's skip ahead, oh, maybe a hundred years or so, uh, to Babylon. Uh, the Emperor Cyrus at one point decides that he's going to allow um, our people to return to, to Israel. And he appoints a Kohen, a priest by the name of Ezra. And he says, you can take the Torah. After all, the Torah was probably put together right there in, in Babylon. And you can bring it to, and rebuild the, rebuild the second temple. We have two different versions of this story. One in the book of Ezra and one in the book of Nehemiah, who was, Nehemiah was Ezra's supporter, let's just say. Uh, and the first one, and Ezra says, oh, and, he, and when, of course, when Ezra went, he went with the might of the Babylonian empire. So he went with priests, I'm told. He went with prophets, we're told. He went with um, dancers and singers and musicians. And he went with soldiers, the might of the Babylonian empire. Okay. The book of Nehemiah tells the story a little differently. Instead of saying prophets, they replace that word with Levites. Okay. So the Levites, again, are somehow into this, into this, into this system. Um, there is a theory. Oh, uh, then the most important thing about the Levites were, and this again is in the, story, in the book of Nehemiah, the Le Ezra is offering sacrifices morning to night, and the Levites are told to go out to the people, the men, the women, and the children, and teach God's law according to the level of everyone's understanding. Wow, that's an important piece. So there's a theory that during this period of time, um, a group developed called the Sofrim. We, today, we mean, Sofrim means scribes. Then it probably meant scholars. And um, it's the Persian period. It went, started around Ezra, and it ended at the time of uh, Simon the Just, who was the last member of the Great Assembly. So we're talking about the first chapter of the Ethics of the Fathers, basically. And uh, the scribe's job was to... Institute religious and social uh, spheres, spheres. They taught the laws. They took the halachot. They interpreted the biblical texts that they had um, and in, so that it was understandable to, to most of the people. I would like to think that most of them were Levites. There's, we don't know. This is just me, me, me speaking. Um, unlike the impression we have of the Levites today, so-called second-class priests, the Levites were much, much more important than we realized. Uh, they traveled from one place to another, teaching and interpreting the law. Eventually, they purchased land and moved into communities. And during that time, they were the people who interpreted God's law. So if, if you're a Levite, this is your tradition. Be a teacher. Be one who ministers to the needs of other people and make sure your children and your grandchildren know about it. Uh, questions. I give you a lot of stuff here. I'm Marty on mute. Alan, can you unmute everybody? Okay. Everybody is unmuted. Yeah, I, it's fascinating what you wrote, and I think it's the first time I've ever seen a real role for the uh, Levine. Um, it's, it seems to me that what the role you were describing is um, a rabbinic role that they in fact were serving as local rabbis in a time when they didn't have uh, local rabbis. And I, I, it's just a fascinating kind of thing. I remember last year, <laughs> wait, is somebody, can we mute whoever's making noise? I'll take care of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I do remember last year giving a, a drash uh, on uh, the Shabbat Pinchas, and they had a, uh, a second census then, and I did comparison against the first census and put a nice be beautiful spreadsheet together and, and, uh, and looked at which tribes were, were growing and which ones were, were declining over the 38 years in the desert. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, what, I, what I see here is that the predictions of where and which tribes got uh, territory when they went into Israel Menasha, because they had grown 64%, got a huge territory south of Haifa, going uh, all the way across to uh, uh, the Jordan River and then beyond. Uh, Menasha, I think, um, they unfortunately, I'd say, were, were, were captured a couple hundred years later. I don't know that Moshe, I'm not sure that the exact spelling, I'm visualizing an Aleph in Menasha, and I'm not sure that a a Moshe could come out of that, but maybe, no, maybe mem, yes. mem, in the Hebrew it's Mem Nun Shin Hey. Oh, okay. So Moshe could have been. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, it's just a fascinating concept. Is there a real chance that the Levim were, in fact, uh, subsumed by the, the rabbis? They became, okay. They, so this, obviously, this is, uh, rabbis don't have to be Levim right now. Right. So in, so in no. your uh, in the notes that I that that you could download at the last at the last paragraph on the second page, there's a note about uh, Pharisees, Sofrim, and, and rabbis. And uh, I, when I put that in there, I was thinking the same way you were you did. And then um, this past week, I did some more research, and I realized it's totally historical. It's wrong. Uh, the first rabbi was Yochanan ben Zakkai. We know that. So we we're talking Roman times, and one could think that. Again, okay. okay, but he really was the first, the first rabbi. But and this, somebody has their mute on, Ellen. Okay, I've un I've muted them. Okay, uh, I I thought there might have been a transition from the Pharisees who interpreted the you know to to the Sofrim to to the rabbis, but there's no evidence of that um, whatsoever. And I'm sure my colleagues would not be happy to learn that that was the case. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Norm. So Chuck, you know, I, I've read a lot because you usually suggested the books to me and I'm totally confused because it seems that the, the Levites are the subject of being put into a category because nobody knows who else to put into that category. Let me explain. I read one book where it was the Levites that were the subject of the Exodus, because the other tribes were already in Israel. So, it's, and that's how we have, and, and the Levites are the ones that redacted the Torah, and that's why we have a book of Leviticus. And, and we, we have all these roles for the Levites. Moses is a Levite. I, and, and what I was reading said, that's not an accident. So, so what, I love this conversation because there's such a, uh, uh, is not a confusion, but a, but an exploration of who the Levites were. What what was their role, and who were, were they? The ones that wrote the Torah, were they the ones that were expelled from Egypt? Were, you know. Okay, okay, so let me let me see if I can unpack this a little bit. Um, clearly, we we don't know the true story, but um, Richard Free Elliot Freeman in his book Exodus That's is the true. one who suggested that it was a small group of priests who will call <laughs> Levites who had this relationship and they were the ones who moved out and went into, and that was really the Exodus. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. Yes. Um, it, very, it very, really, really is. Uh, in terms of who wrote the Torah. So we know that the Torah went, that we well, have the first place that's divided into Chumash, former Nabi Mishani in, in the writings, okay? Because it all didn't happen once. There was a process of hundreds of years when this was go when this was going on. Uh, for example, um, you know that if you look at uh, the uh, there are three chap three parshiot in Deuteronomy, Kitetze, uh, Shoftim, and something else. The ones they're all in an order, and that they, that kind of reflects a lot of Josiah's laws. So Josiah we know is responsible for one you know part formulating creating part of the Chumash. Okay, and then there were many editions later on, probably which took place um, 
in Babylon. Uh, and, and then I'm sure it was a politically, uh, it, was, it was like putting together the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Um, it didn't happen overnight. Um, and I think in a lot of it was since, since one of the purposes of getting of the, of the Chumash it were, and, and most of the text was to get us back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. It clearly had, because that was the place of our faith and our homeland. Um, it probably had a strong Kohanic influence. Okay. Um, we don't know what the role of the Levites were in, in Babylon. But, and, we, and the Levites probably were not all descendants of, um, you know, of Levi, Levi, because who knows where they came from. 200 years in, in the Northern Kingdom. And then that's when, and then the Northern Kingdom and the Assyrians that conquered the Northern Kingdom, we lost 10 tribes. They're the lost tribes. Yeah. Who knows, you know, about that. And then Chronicles, of course, really is about the, the Kohanic, the Kohanic, Kohanic families. So um, that's another question. We have a uh, good idea yeah. because Moses, Ezra brought the Torah, the five books with him back to Jerusalem that the text was put together at that point. We don't know, some, we don't know who were the writers. We just don't know. And we know that the, maybe 200 years later, we find the books of, of uh, some of it at the same time because uh, David and Goliath was also to get us back to Jerusalem. But uh, some of the other, other texts in Samuel and in Kings uh, probably weren't put into a written format for a couple hundred years later. And then when you get to the writings, some of the writings are really classic Greek stuff, like the Song but, of Songs. But going back to the Chumash, isn't it corroborated that it might have been written in Babylonia? Because as soon as Ezra got back to Jerusalem, he was reading it from the steps. He was teaching it to the people. Right. Because so, it might have been a new... new. No, I'm sure. So what, was, what I'm saying is, and we don't know the answer to this, he certainly brought back the scroll of the Law of Moses, right. which we, we assume was the Chumash. Right. Okay. But we don't know, well, maybe some people know, I don't know, my skills aren't that great, if there were additions and, re and redactions which took place afterwards. Sure. Michael, do you have any sense of that? Yes. Will you say something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a rabbi, I'm just a simple Jew from Baltimore. Okay, go ahead, tell me what you think. I thought that Josiah did a fourth thing, which was absolutely fantastic. The priest, had nothing to do except collect money and keep the temple in good stead in Jerusalem. And the, the, temple, and the temple at that time that Josiah did, it was basically a, a house, a yeah. big house, but it wasn't this fancy thing that we think about. It's just a house. So they ended up using the money that came to the coffers to live on. So he did two, two things with the coffers that I thought were wonderful. Number one, he basically bankrupt the Kohanim by saying, we'll put a lockbox on the treasury where you make your donations and we'll get rid of the, the uh, not just the other places of worship. We had a lot of places of worship. We used to call them the Elilim and he got rid of them. Then he wanted to renew a religious fervor. So he took the folk tales that we had as a people, what I call these fire tide stories, these fire chats, and he molded them together. And he took that and put together the law, which is those three partiote in uh, uh, what's it? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, thank you. And that, that became the law and he made the rules. Now, about a hundred years before, the priest and the really learned guys who became the Sophrim were thrown out of the Northern Kingdoms. They needed a place to go, they needed a place to teach. So that when they end up going into Babylonia, he kept them together, he put them in cities, he gave them small uh, countries to run. And that's when they put the Torah together, as we tend to know it. And they came in with various editions of it and various stories. But the stuff that's called the, uh, I just lost the name of it, Chuck, the, uh, uh, the Deuteronomic text, which, is, which also includes uh, Yehosho and Shoftim. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, Yehosho, Joshua and Judges was also part of it was considered right. the, the text were expanded and expounded and they were, they were relayed and they became big. The object was to make Josiah look a lot like David to reunite the kingdom and to make it a new country and to make it a new religion. When it got back to Jerusalem, which was roughly 5, 
39540, or if you go by the later date, 100 years later, they had started to pick up the Hellenistic influence. At that point, the Hellenism was very, very big in Jerusalem, very, very big in what was then the Jewish world. And then we incorporated a lot of it. And that's how we ended up with the Torah we do we used to be have. That's how we ended up with the Talmud we have today. That's correct. The Roman and Greek. Hmm. Other comments or questions? Mike, I was just wondering. Uh, you said that the first temple was just like a big house. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't it was a, a big building. Structure. No, it wasn't this magnificent thing. Also, I believe there never was an Exodus. All right. Okay. And that's a different story. I believe there were never, I believe there's no historical evidence that there ever was an Exodus. The only thing we have is the name Biviru, Biru on a, a certain tell from around 1,000 or 1,500, depending how you date it. And then the question is, who are the Biru? And we don't believe it's us. Well, actually, I disagree with it. Somebody chatting. Ron, did you have something you want to say? Uh, no, it's just coughing. I'm sorry. Okay. No, I mean, actually, if you're... I don't know if you can still do this, but if you go to the tomb of, tomb of Ramses II in Egypt and you look at the hieroglyphics, which I did this last November, there's um, Ramses, of course, was the one, that, he's the pharaoh. And, um, and so there's a listing of all of his, his he wasn't succeeded by his first son. Um, there's a listing of, of the, his succeeded by his sixth son. And um, when it came to the name of his first son, there's a sign, a hieroglyph, which shows that he, that he died. Okay, so that some, and this is also in, the, in this tomb, is the only word we have that, that it's not Habira, but the only word which, ref, which refers to, to Jewish people. So um, it's, uh, maybe it's mythology. What was, but what was that word, Chuck? If I remembered it, I would tell you. Um, <laughs> okay, you know, take a, no, never mind. Um, we can, like, we can argue this but, but the bottom, But the bottom line is that I'm, it's, well, I, I'm not saying there was an exodus or there were plagues. I'm just saying, and I'm, not, I'm just saying that at the time of Ramses, his, his firstborn son was killed, and um, that's where maybe that's where we got it, as as we created the the master Exodus story. We know that the plagues, because of the uh, uh, oh god, it's in uh, with uh, I just lost the name. Of it. The island in Greece that had the volcano in that's thirteen. Huh? Sorry, sorry, no, I know about that. It had the, no, let's not discuss the plagues, please. Okay. Because that's the disproof. Really. Don't want to get it. But this is um, really Elliot Friedman's book. Yeah. Whether there was an exit. Um, next week we're going to go. Let me next week, which is our last session, we're going to go back and talk about David's relationship with his wives and his children. Okay, and uh, it's particularly the, the the main son who we love the most, and we have this great, you know, literary quote: "Absalom, Absalom, my son, would that I had died for you." So I just want to tell you that's what we'll be doing we'll be doing next week. Um, I've done my part. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. This is great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you Michael. very much, Rabbi. Thank you very much Thanks, for participating. Chuck. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Chuck. Tomorrow night, uh, Seaboard Region presents uh, uh, Rabbi Cohen, who we saw at the uh, convention. You have to pre-register for that. Go on our website. We'll give you all, all the information. Right. Again, I thank you all for participating. Rabbi, again, thank you for presenting. Next Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, Rabbi will present his uh, fourth and final presentation, but maybe we'll persuade him to do something, uh, start a new, a new series. Good night, guys. <laughs> Time to drink wine again, Chuck. Good night. Thank you very much, all. Have a good yeah, night. Stay well. Stay well. Thanks, thank you, Thanks Elliot. for inviting me. Okay. Mike, good doing this. No, he's good. Where, where are you in Baltimore? <laughs>